right. Hello, everyone. So welcome. Before we get started, Third Place Books would like to acknowledge that we are on the unceded ancestral land of the first people of Seattle, the Duwamish people past and present, and honor with gratitude the Duwamish people and the land itself. So welcome to our virtual event space. My name is Allie and I'm a bookseller at the Lake Forest Park location. I'm your host for this evening. Um, I am so excited to be introducing Jane Wong and Susan Nguyen here to discuss their collections, How Not to Be Afraid of Everything and Dear Diaspora. But before we get into the good stuff, on behalf of all of us here at Third Place Books, I just want to quickly thank you all so very much for tuning in. For those of you who may not know, we are an independent bookstore with three locations in the Seattle area. And as much as we miss having these events in our bookstores, it has been such a delight to expand this online program to connect readers and authors in a virtual space. So thank you all so much for tuning in and buying books. Your support is what makes all of this possible. If you haven't gotten your hands on copies of the books already and you would like to, I will be linking books in the chat all evening. For those of you in the Seattle area, come on in. All three of our locations are open or you can place an order online and come pick them up in store. Or if you're not local, we of course do ship. So go ahead and follow that link in chat over to our website. And while you are over there, I definitely encourage you to check out some of our other upcoming events. We have an exciting roster coming up in the next few months. And if you'd like to stay in touch with our community, you can sign up for our newsletter. It's a weekly update about events and exciting releases, our online book clubs. And of course, you can follow us on any of the major social media platforms. We are third at Third Place Books for the quickest updates and recommendations. Speaking of social media, um, if you'd like to check out some of our past virtual events, you can find most of them on our YouTube channel, including this event in the next couple of days. So if you'd like to see our other virtual events or share this one, go ahead and track us down over there. Um, we are here this evening for about an hour and towards the end, we will be taking questions. So if you have any questions, which we very much hope that you do, go ahead and leave those in the Q&A box, which should be either at the top or bottom of your screen. It is different than the chat box, which is great for virtual applause and connecting with each other. I absolutely invite you to share where you're tuning in from in the chat. Um, when it comes time for questions though, please do make sure those end up in the Q&A so we can most easily find them. Um, while you're in our chat and question spaces, I do want to remind everyone to please lead with kindness and refrain from any inappropriate behavior or harassment. Um, for anyone interested, there are auto-generated closed captions available from the menu at the top or bottom of your screen. Select the live transcript button to enable or disable them. And finally, should any technical issues arise, we will work as quickly as we can to resolve them and we appreciate your patience and understanding. Alrighty, so at this point, it is time for us to settle in and get comfortable because without further ado, I am so thrilled to introduce Jane Wong, the author of Overpour and of course the book of the evening, How to Not Be Afraid of Everything. Her poems and essays can be found in places such as Best American Non-Required Reading 2019, Best American Poetry 2015, American Poetry Review, and so many others. She is a Kundaman Fellow, recipient of the Push Cart Prize and fellowships and residencies from Harvard's Woodbury Poetry Room, the U.S. Fulbright Program, Artist Trust, and many, many others. Her first solo art show after preparing the altar, The Ghosts Feast Feverishly, was exhibited at the Fry Art Museum in 2019. She is an associate professor of creative writing at Western Washington Interview University, my goodness. <laughs> Her collection, How Not to Be Afraid of Everything, explores the vulnerable ways we articulate and reckon with fear, fear of intergenerational trauma and the silent hidden histories of families. The next author joining us this evening is Susan Nguyen, whose debut collection, Dear Diaspora won the 2020 Prairie Schooner Book Prize in Poetry. In 2018, PBS NewsHour named her one of three women poets to watch. Her work has appeared in Diagram, Tin House, and elsewhere. Uh, she has a tin, she is a Tin House alum and has won the Aledia 
um, Rodriguez Memorial Prize and various fellowships from the Virginia G. Piper Center for Creative Writing. Her collection, Dear Diaspora, sheds light on the intersections of girlhood and diaspora. So thank you both so much for being here. I am so excited to listen in on this conversation. If you need anything, of course, give me a shout. I will be listening. And the same goes for all of you in the audience. I will be in chat. And with that, I'm going to pass the stage to our authors. So welcome, both of you. <laughs> Yay. Snap claps for you, Ali. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. Um, and yeah, so excited to read with Susan tonight. And we have lots of poems and conversation ahead. Um, but uh, yeah, we, we kind of wanted to kick off the evening um, by kind of sharing. We were talking about like home and things that, that you know, give us comfort and thinking about diaspora, um, uh, you know, like what kind of brings us towards home. And so we actually wanted to start by sharing um, kind of like show and tell, which is kind of cheesy, <laughs> but kind of sweet. I kind of like to start it that way um, with just like items that kind of, you know, remind us of home or bring us home. Um, so yeah, I don't know if Susan, if you want to start oh, with oh, you okay, okay. thinking about home. Yeah. Um, okay. I know earlier I told you I had a recipe book, but I think I've I've changed my mind about what I wanted to share. <laughs> uh, originally, I was going to share a recipe, a recipe book um, for Vietnamese food recipes because I'm in Arizona and my my parents, my most of my family I grew up with is um back on the east coast of Virginia. So I often miss like good Vietnamese like home cooking, which I am not a cook, so I have this cookbook, but mostly if it gets used, it's my partner who's the cook who, who tries. Um <laughs> and then I'll send my mom a photo. And she's like, that's great, but also did you try this, this, and this? And I'm like, no, um, it's not as good as yours. But um I actually wanted to share um this oh I don't know if you can see it this stick <laughs> um that has traveled with me from Virginia to Arizona <laughs> um I think this was from like my college days um I went to college in southwest southwest Virginia um that's I think when I really discovered um like my love for hiking and nature so mm -hmm. now that I'm on in the southwest um often I think of just like green in Virginia and the green hills and um the green that we have in Arizona is just a little bit different, a little bit more sparse. Um, and yeah, for some reason, I, I had this, I had this stick that I ended up painting in college, and it just traveled with me when I road tripped from Virginia to, to Arizona. Um, and it was, I was trying to find something earlier, and it was sitting on one of my bookshelves. So I was like, this is perfect. Um, yeah, looks like a galactic stick. <laughs> um, but yeah, that is my show until item for y'all tonight. I love the galactic <laughs> and also thinking about, you know, um, literally our, our environment is, is mm -hmm. a new home and what we can bring um, with us everywhere we go. I love that. And there's sometimes just like right in front of us, like it's always with us. Um, I brought in um, a, a dried mushroom. I'll try to like get it close. Um, it's very like it's I'm sure maybe <laughs> for those of you who, who know this mushroom, this dried mushroom, the smell is really intense. It's filling up the room actually. Um, and if it was in water, which, you know, I guess if I dunked it <laughs> into my cup of water right now, it would just kind of um, start kind of filling up with juice, I suppose. Um, it's such an intense, uh, you know, taste and smell. But this totally brings me home because like my mom always, when I would go home um, and still uh, would already like put out the dried mushrooms in a, in a bowl of warm water and it would just kind of, um, I guess like, repuff, <laughs> um, I think that's a word, repuff into something um, that will go into soup. And so it, for me, this is like the base of soup and it just, it just brings me home. It brings me so much joy. And my, my mom always sends me um, care packages that are either like this, like stuff like this, or Trader Joe's. Like, it's just like, <laughs> it's pretty much like I can get the Trader Joe's stuff, but it's just funny. It's either Trader Joe's stuff um, or like, you know, um, little ingredients like this or dried, uh, you know, tofu, for instance, tofu skin, mm -hmm. stuff like that. Um, but anyway, this really reminds me of home, just the smell of this pungent mushroomy smell. It smells really good. And of course, like here in the Pacific Northwest, it's like mushrooms are everywhere. There's so much cool, like spores everywhere. So anyway, I just wanted to share the, the mushrooms. I love that the mushroom and the galactic stick somehow may live in I don't know, like a, a natural space together, potentially. Yeah. And you mentioned it earlier. I was like, oh, now I want to change my object to something, I don't know, more 
natural, like you said. Um, that's that's super sweet in terms of like your mom sending you like super very specific things or Trader Joe's. <laughs> or Trader Joe's, exactly. Yeah. Whatever she's like the new the new thing that she's into. Um, yes, I love that. I love opening the space. I'm sure in the chat, if you, if anyone wants to like share the things that, you know, the objects that make you kind of, you know, think about home too, that'd be super lovely. Um, but yeah, I, we're going to basically read some poems. This is going to be a slightly different type of reading where, um, Susan and I are going to kind of, um, I guess echo each other or list, like kind of deep listen to each other. So, um, it'll be a few rounds of us reading a little bit, uh, or I would read a little bit. Susan Susan would read it a little bit, vice versa, um, and Susan's going to kind of um, close us out. Um, so that's kind of, we're going to talk a little bit too, so we'll kind of be in conversation through the poems, but also um, each other. Um, and so that's what's going to happen, and it'll be very fluid and, uh, you know, a little less um, structured, I think, than, and than uh, I guess, what a, a reading usually is like. Um, and yeah, we're excited to hear your questions and to chat even more, too. Um, but yeah, I'm going to kick it off, and then um, Susan will add some poems, too. So I'm just going to read one poem, um, and just to start off the round. Um, and then, yeah, Susan will read a bit, too, and we'll, we'll chat. Um, so, so yeah, my book, How to Not Be Afraid of Everything, came out last month, which still feels kind of like a whirlwind, but it's just been such a joy um, thinking about um, what this book means to me and how vulnerable it is to thinking about um, family, of course, but um, thinking about the things that we're afraid of, um, ghosts, um, which I am not afraid of, um, but certainly the histories that, you know, I come from. Um, I'm going to start off with a poem called uh, A Cosmology, and uh, yeah, so it's, this is A Cosmology. I told the earth to settle back down, to lay deep in its mud armchair, to soften the static flaring from its mouth. Can we slow down, tender those we miss? The sky, ledge, or loom dangles in my grandfather's mouth, jawbone in the burial ground. In my dream last night, he was a golden beet in January snow. I grate ginger over an ant hold, certain it would gild them too. I repeat, I will not be afraid that the world is about power. My ghosts fill me with feathers, my lungs a mane unplucked. The near promise of erasure settles me in this world, buzzing fridge fluorescence. The rotting head of broccoli in my grandmother's bowl blooms with power. What we keep, we eat. What we love, we break off. In another world, a bee falls headfirst into a pitcher of rice wine. I set an altar. The altar billows with ferns good in any soup. Ants sing along the stems. I scrub the sugar off my face and offer this kiss, my gold leaf self sheet by sheet. Oh my gosh, thank you for getting us started. That poem was so, so beautiful. And it was wonderful to hear you, to hear you actually reading it. Um, I guess before I jump into my own poems, I think some of the things that stood out to me just were, I mean, throughout your collection really is the the nature imagery. Like we just mentioned, you brought your mushroom, like things of the earth. And I, I see a lot of that in your collection, um, things of the earth and, and food and stuff too. And there's a tenderness there. Um, and I'm kind of curious, you don't have to answer this or you can take this however you want, I guess. <laughs> um, if we're reserving Q&A for, for later. Um, yeah, but like, can you speak a bit more to just like what your inspirations are, especially when it comes to, to imagery? Oh, yeah. I mean, I think imagery, I love that. And I, I can't wait to hear your images too. But imagery for me is so tied to um, literally the things that I, I think I've I see kind of growing up, but also transforms like the broccoli in the bowl that blooms with power, um, the rotting broccoli. Uh, my grandmother, um, even though, you know, I, I have mixed feelings about upward mobility and, you know, I'm a professor and all, and I did not grow up with much. Um, and my grandmother, um, you know, still buys rotten 
food from the grocery store because it's it's on sale like you know the dollar bag of like um the food that, that's about to go to rot and she she buys the, the cheap discounted vegetables um and I I told her once you know like um you know I can buy you the the, the real like you know like a good orange or like a good broccoli you don't have to buy the cheap rotten one um and I think part of that you know has you know moved into that image and it's just it it begin, begins to bloom more meaning I think um because of the story behind it um so yeah I feel like all my images have stories little stories behind it like as to how I got there um but yeah, thanks so much for that, Susan. Yeah. And I, I can't wait to see what <laughs> really sees you. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I love that you mentioned like the the transformation um, and the story behind it too. And also just that made me think of not my, my just my parents, you know, like me wanting to like buy them things because I'm like, hey, this could be like easier or more convenient. And they're just like, but why? No, like I'm going to stick with this way because that's what I'm used to or it's more economical and all the things, you know, and, and I'm like, or I could do this thing and sometimes I, I have to stop asking you just to do the thing or else because they're never going to say like yes like get us that thing you know um oh gosh okay I think um okay so my po my collection is called Dear Diaspora um the title comes from a handful of poems scattered throughout um called Letter to the Diaspora um the line the first line is Dear Diaspora um and the collection follows this character Susie with an eye, you know, a somewhat fictionalized, fictionalized version of myself in many ways. Um, and I think there was mention in your poem, Jane, um, I think it was dreaming and it made me think of one of my, the first letters to diaspora I have in my, in my collection um, where I mentioned dream in a very, a very different way, but it kind of sparked something for me, um, the idea of dream and, and power. Um, so I'm going to start with Letter to the Diaspora. Dear Diaspora, I believe in the American dream strike through. Last night, I had the American dream. In the dream, I had an indoor pool. In the dream, I walked my dead dog with a diamond leash. I ate a greasy burger with my perfect hands. I had the most beautiful sex. My skin was smooth, alabaster as the moon. In the morning, everything had changed. There was no pool, only twine for drying clothes. The dead remained dead. My perfect hands held nothing. Nothing was better. Um, and I think it's okay if you, Jane, I'm gonna read one more, one more poem. Um, I mentioned like your, your natural, like nature, um, earth elements and, and imagery in the poem you read and just in general um, throughout your whole collection, which I, I really love because as a writer, but also especially as a reader, imagery I think is what really draws me in and that's like what I connect with, especially um, emotionally too. Um, so I'm gonna read a poem called Cicada Summer. Um, I mentioned earlier, I'm from the East Coast. So you know, we have cicadas that come out every seven years. Um, I don't know if that's everywhere, but I remember um, that was a big deal for us as kids. Um, like the first time they, they, they appeared in elementary school for me. And I have lots of memories of my kids running around catching them, um, daring each other to eat them. I don't know if that's real or if it's just a memory invented, but you know, I've thought about it enough that now it has become a memory. Um, cicada summer. The cicadas come from the ground and enter the world in currents. Streaming down tree trunks over branches, across sidewalks and roads, the males pulsing their abdomens, singing for sex. In the field behind the school, Susie and her classmates stand still as dozens climb over their bodies, careful not to crush the winged insects beneath their feet, fearful of littering the ground with broken glass. Susie collects every wing she can find. Each one becomes a small body of water she carries in her pocket, a broken window pane she holds to each eye. She counts dozens more on her way home and imagines how they would taste. Hands in her pockets, touching the wings to each fingertip, she wonders, would they still sing on the way to death and would it sound any different? Today, she walks through uneven fields of green and spits into tall grass, the roots of trees, listens as the clicking of cicadas fills her body with song. The green lacerates her ankles, and she imagines her blood mixed with dirt will nourish 
will add to the muscle tremor of the earth. I think I'm gonna end there for now. Wow, Susan, thank you so much. Oh my gosh, the cicadas, the broken window panes and collecting the wings, so beautiful. Um, <laughs> I was thinking too, oh my gosh, like the, the, the poem you read before with the, the strike through in the American dream and the, the pool and everything, was that the line with the leash too? Just like, <laughs> so, so, so good. Um, oh my gosh, I've been thinking a lot about, um, <laughs> how do you not think about the American dream? Yeah. Um, really, truly, and it's, 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 uh, it's sickliness, I suppose, um, and yeah, I think I'll, I'll, I'll read some poems, I, and I, you know, after I read this particular poem, would love to ask you a question, um, but it led me to, uh, there's a series in my book called The Frontier, which, mm -hmm. I mean, really kind of thinks about that strike through that you were just kind of, um, like, dreaming through, I suppose, <laughs> um, and thinking about the the pool kind of not being there, and instead there's this kind of twine for drying clothes, um, like the dryness of the American dream, and like um, the, the desire for that, that pool, um, and that like bright blue, but it doesn't come true, um, did not mean to rhyme. Um, <laughs> so this is from the frontier, um, and I'll read this, and then I uh, kind of have a question for, for Susan. Um, yeah, so the frontier. Your rights, do you know? To not let in, to speak to whom? To sign over nothing, silence as a remainder, how I failed at long division, wrapping my arms around each wrong digit. My brother and I hid under tables when someone knocked on the door. Strangers, another kind of earthquake. Between overtime night shifts, my mother paces. She tries a new path, orbits our neighborhood to ease her vertigo. A marvel how we set foot on the moon. A marvel shift after shift how she is still moving awake. Strangers, a neighbor yells at my mother from behind her screen door. A partition for mosquitoes flies liability. She tells my mother, you can't walk here. My mother is all breath and moon smoke through grit and grids. I live here too. To love a country that refuses to look you in the eye. To love what keeps moving even when it shouldn't. We build our houses, our homes. We pull splinters from our knees, one after the other, bending each time as if in prayer. Reminders of silence. My mother's refusal to hide, to be told what to do or not to do. The frontier bows before us in apology or majesty ingested. Break bread, eat instead. Containers of oil and fat filled and refilled again. Russet potato cheeks, red lobster birthdays, buttered rolls fitted in purses, puckered for a kiss. What is possible? Letting bread go stale, bread itself possible. Seated, unseated, rosemaried, whatever and whatnot. The frontier is winning. Hard to undo this want for anything. Lamb, lobster, tail and all. This infinite martyrdom between us. How on another shore, my mother could only afford to meet eat meat once a year on her birthday, boiled rice with sweet potatoes, her comfort. My grandmother salvages the sweet peels, brown like the bark of a tree I've loved for years. I worry that this recipe will be in Food and Wine magazine. Epicurean discoveries of peasant food. My comfort, stirred fried tomato and egg appears in, do not look this up, but the frontier beams and thickens, each glowing intestine, pink and pinker still. Comfort for you, comfort for all. Do not look this up. Um, and I really want, that is a recipe <laughs> of my favorite childhood dish that appeared in a, a very uh, famous magazine um, as like peasant food of sorts. Um, but yeah, I couldn't help but think about, um, you know, Susan's poem with the strike through American dream in the pool um, and kind of how that led to, you know, the frontier for me. Um, and I guess my, my question for you, Susan, as you know, as you think about what poem to read next was um, really thinking about the, the character of Susie. Like, I'm curious how, how you came up with 
this character, um, which is, you know, of course, in part, in part you, but um, versus kind of having that, that I voice, like it's such a unique approach to these poems. Um, so yeah, uh, and especially if you want to talk about the, the poem with the, you know, the, the first poem you read with the, the strike through in the um, pool, I'd love to hear any thoughts you have on that too. Yeah, um, thank you for your question. And thank you for, for the poem you just read. Like there are so many lines. I was writing them on, by hand and then I was like, okay, I want to throw them in the chat too. And I was like, I'm not fast enough because there are too many things I'm trying to write. And then I'd hear another line <laughs> or another image. Um, yeah, honestly, how did Susie come to be? Um, for some reason, I think in my sec, I did, I did a three-year MFA at Arizona State University. And at some point between my second and third year, I don't know where I got this idea but where I was thinking, okay, you're writing only these like I poems. Um, and I felt really self-conscious about that for some reason. And I, for, I don't know how it came to be, whether it was just through the readings we were doing or the conversation, but I got kind of self-conscious of like, oh, like I, all I'm doing is writing these same I poems. Like, does anyone care? Is this interesting to anyone else but me, right? Um, and at the same time, as I was starting to write more poems just about like my identity, especially in terms of like my Vietnamese identity, which I spent a long time like purposely not looking at or pushing away. Um, even I was having a hard time writing those poems. And I think I actively kind of avoided doing that for most of my MFA. Um, but yeah, and for some reason, the poems that were hard to access were some of the, the younger adolescent childhood ones too. I don't know why, because like looking back now, I'm like, oh, I totally probably could have done this differently, but at the time it was kind of a mental or emotional block or something. Um, so writing in the third person through Susie with an I um, was kind of a good way for me to jump in, get into that, you know, and I don't know if I, I would have thought it was going to become a book or just kind of writing or thought exercise for me to kind of get into it. Um, but I wrote a lot of them. <laughs> um, and I also had these I poems that are in my collection too. And it took me a while and like the help of some mentors and stuff to realize this can all be one collection because it's all, you know, it's all part of like this, for me, my, my experience is part of the Vietnamese diaspora, even if I haven't necessarily seen that before um, in my own reading. Um, yeah, definitely shame. And now shame and pride, and the shame is a bit different in terms of like, well, now you, I spent time pushing that away and now I'm trying to catch up and there's so much to learn for sure. Um, yeah, so I think that answered your question in, in terms of Susie and I, yeah. <laughs> um, let's see, I'm trying to think of what, what poem to read next. Um, I think, okay, I think, let's see if I can find the right poem. Yeah, I wanted to read, um, a poem about a, mo a mom poem, um, based on, on what you read, Jane. Um, this one is called In a Past Life, um, and it's pretty close to the end of, end of my collection. Um, and some of this is inspired by interviews I did with my, my family. Um, but also, as I say, there's a lot in my, in my collection um, that is fictionalized too. It's funny because a lot of my family, my cousins have read, read my book. Um, one of my cousins texts me saying like, because there's a poem where I think I refer um, I, I say big head because that's something my cousins actually did call me for like a, a time when I was younger because um, kids bully each other and my cousin texted me and was like we didn't really do it that much um, and I was like well now it's in a book so maybe maybe it is real <laughs> um, all right in a past life mother was a preschool teacher 5 a.m church goer outside her house grandfather cut hair to his right was grandmother selling firework powder air drying fish pot and bumto and bust back on grandmother's lap. In a past life, mother ran up and down the stairs to stoke the 10 hour fire burning under gluttonous rice. After 75, she was bused to a field, stepped barefoot into mud, dug irrigation systems, afraid of what she might step on. When grandfather fell, no one knew the word stroke. Grandmother rubbed oil on his hands and feet, sold MSG. In a past life, Mother woke up to the sound of cyclos, notching the roads. When grandmother died, mother flew back and tied white linen around her head in mourning. It was not like the first time on the plane when they served packets of peanut butter and jelly, Concord grape. I stole dozens. I did not know if I would see them again. I think I'm gonna 
yeah, I think I'm going to end there and pass it back to you, Jane, if you're ready. <laughs> oh my gosh. Thanks, Susan. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so I'm like, you know, was it the, the oil mother wakes up in the past, like the past life, everything. Um, okay. So that was <laughs> calm. I cannot help but think about mothers now and you mm -hmm. kind of are sending me down that, 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 that route and kind of thinking about family too. Um, your poem's so sensory, so I'm in that space still. Um, the rice too. Um, yeah, I think I'm gonna read a poem that is in my mother's voice. I was just thinking about that as you just read, um, which is called, um, I put on my fur coat. Um, and so this is a persona poem. Um, so this is my mother speaking, not me. Um, but I will say that um, I did actually put on her coat when I wrote this poem. Um, and the little story behind it is that, um, yeah, uh, growing up in a restaurant, um, you know, in which, you know, restaurants can fail at any moment. Ours did. My father basically gambled it away. But, um, but yeah, my, the first kind of big paycheck of sorts, um, or maybe the only one, um, my mom went out and bought a fancy coat um, and not so much, did not have savings or anything or didn't put the money away, just bought this coat. Uh, so anyway, this poem is called I Pull On My Fur Coat and it's in the voice of my mother. Um, so thank you, Susan, for bringing us to moms. Um, I put on my fur coat and leave a bit of ankle to show. I take off my shoes and make myself comfortable. I defrost a chicken and chew on the bone. In public, I smile as wide as I can and everyone shields their eyes from my light. At night, I knock down nests off telephone poles and feel no regret. I greet spiders rising from underneath the floorboards one by one, hello, hello. Outside, the garden roars with ice. I want to shine as bright as a miner's cap in the dirt dark, to glimmer as if washed in fish scales. Instead, I become a balm and sow my daughter, my son, the cold mice in the garage. Instead, I take the garbage out at midnight. I move furniture away from the wall to see what we hide. I stand in the center of every room and ask, am I the only animal here? Um, and I'll just read one more poem, also kind of thinking about all the kind of I don't know, visceral details um, in Susan's poem, but also still thinking about family. Um, and it is called Lessons on Lessening. I wake to the sound of my neighbors upstairs as if they are bowling. And maybe they are, all pins and love fallen over. I lay against my floor if only to feel that kind of affection. What I've learned time and again, get up, you cannot have what they have. And the eyes of a dead rat can't say anything. In Jersey, the sink breaks and my mother keeps a bucket underneath to save water for laundry. A trickle of water is no joke, I've learned that. Neither is my father wielding a knife in starlight. I was taught that everything and everyone is self-made, that you can make a window out of anything if you want. This is why I froze insects, to see if they will come back to life. How I began each day, the swoosh of wings, get up. The ants pouring out of the sink onto my arms and dish heavy water. My arms branches, a swarm I did not ask for. No one told me I'd have to learn to be polite, to let myself be consumed for what I cannot control. I must return to my younger self, to wearing my life like heavy wool, weaved in my own weight to pretend not to know when the debtors come to collect. And I'll stop there and pass it, pass it to Susan, who I think maybe you'll close us out, potentially. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Oh my gosh. I just want to call out, like, I want to Brian 
sorry, shine as bright as a miner's cap in the dirt dark. And I think I might be messing this up because I was writing it down, like glimmer with fish scales. I think I missed some words there. Um, and then in your second poem, you can make a window out of anything if you want. Um, wow. Thank you for reading those. Those are beautiful. Those are beautiful. And I was thinking about the, the windows and your broken window panes too. So yeah, that was such a beautiful moment. Yeah. Um, oh gosh. Okay. I am not good at like listening and, and being like beautiful lines and also thinking ahead. So <laughs> um, let's see, maybe I think I'm going to, I really love that line. I want to shine as bright as a miner's cap in the dirt dark. So I think I'm going to go off of that maybe as inspiration. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I have a lot of green um, in my collection and I think Jane said to you, like I, I've noticed a lot of mention of, of, of green as well. Um, so that's what I'm thinking right now um, in regards to that line. So maybe I will read, let's see. Uh, grief as a question. And the, the first line um, is borrowed from um, Darwish. Um, I forget which, which book. Um, I'm not gonna look for it right now, but maybe I'll, I'll type in the chat afterwards. Um, grief as a question. Do you have a permit to sit under the sky? Green is the color of my ecstasy. Lying in the roots of a tree, I want to inhale it. Everywhere I go, I cannot get away. Things that glow, jellyfish, nightlight, screensaver, the first daffodil to show itself, grass stains, tennis ball, glow in the dark constellations, electric energy drink, key lime sour between teeth, Queen Ma, praying mantis, inchworm, sour green apple, soft at the br bruises, caterpillars taking over roads and sidewalks, place in jars covered in saran wrap with poked holes for air, a twig and some grass, Virginia fireflies. We caught them and put an eye to her hands, making empty fists, shook them. By next morning, they no longer glowed. We turned our jars upside down. No one told me. Grief could be so ordinary. Um, I think maybe I will read one more poem. Um, let's see. Okay, I think um, I, I didn't write this down, so I might be misquoting this, but Jane, I feel like in your second poem, there was a line I really loved too, where it's like, I must return to um something I can't remember the word oh yeah my younger self just yes thank you <laughs> okay I was like to my youth that wasn't it I was like that's not quite what it was okay um thank you so I'm going to use that that line as inspiration for um the second poem I think I'll I'll end after this and if there are any questions y'all feel free to throw them in the Q&A and if not like we can just keep talking or reading reading yeah happy to do cool. it yeah <laughs> um all right the first language one, behind the church, we ran through labyrinths of poplar and hickory, dirt paths cutting the ravines and the backs of suburban homes, their brick patios and striped furniture. In the green light of summer, we loved getting lost, how we could step into woods and exit in a cul-de-sac eight blocks away. Loved it best when tadpoles formed a halo around our toes. Two, before he disappeared, my father taught me how to catch tadpoles in my hand. The trick wasn't just to stay still, but to stop breathing. He caught dozens like this, knees bent and pant legs folded, his face inches above the creek. He taught me that our first language was named after tadpoles, the way they moved through water, a knife dissecting the stratosphere, a voice cutting quiet. Three, my third favorite memory of him is walking hand in hand on two lane roads, identifying Virginia trees. In one pocket, a zodiac sign lighter, a button for mother's favorite blouse, and the other, acorns for burying. I can still identify the red oaks. Four, today the tadpoles flow through my fingers like an egg yolk, and my impulse is to cradle one in my mouth. The tadpole swims circles, and my tongue follows, mapping its movement before spitting. All right, I think I'm going to end there. Um, thank, thanks, y'all, for, for listening and helping um, us celebrate our, our books. Um, I don't see anything in the Q&A now, so 
now now is the call. Um, feel free to throw any questions there. Um, in the meanwhile, um, Dan, I don't know if you want to read another poem or if we have any questions, we can always just talk amongst ourselves, just us two until people throw in questions, whatever, whatever feels good. Yeah, thanks for that, Susan. Oh gosh, the tadpoles. Um, <laughs> Fathers, complicated. Um, yeah. Certainly in, in my poems too. Um, yeah, thank you so much for that. And yes, if anyone has any questions, feel free to, to throw them in the, the chatter. I know that there's a, um, a separate Q&A um, uh, little thingy. <laughs> <laughs> um, but if there isn't, I, I suppose we could just like keep writing, uh, writing. It'd be cool if we could write poems on the spot. Um, <laughs> keep reading poems, but I immediately thought about, you know, we we're talking about like the tadpoles and like um, to stop breathing too. There's something, um, this is very haunting about that, that last poem you read. Um, and, you know, thinking about disappeared fathers, um, <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, so I, I mean, if anyone, no one has questions, so we're just gonna keep on like yeah, please, please, the yeah. torch. <laughs> but I was thinking about fathers, which is a little yeah. more tricky than mothers for me, since my father is not in my life and um, disappeared as well. And um, you know, it's really hard because I know that he lives quite close, actually, to my to my mother, not that far in Jersey, but um, it's just such a vast dis distance. Uh, but I'll read this poem, which I actually have never read out loud. Um, that's in the book. It's kind of weird that I haven't read it out loud. But it's called "After My Father Leaves, My Mother Opens the Windows." to let the smoke out, to air out each promise each day my father disappears in Atlantic City. A pigeon flies in and rejoices with us. We dance like hornets, stinging the ugliest of babies. Praise the breath, praise orange glow cleaner. I help her carry my father's floral armchair covered in cigarette burns down to the basement and shove it into a corner we can all forget. Decades before, in another country, in 1967, my grandmother has no windows to open, no pigeon, no basement, no daughter to call her own. In 1967, my grandmother sneaks a cigarette in lousy moonlight and coughs up a cricket. All around her, the Red Army moves through mud, boots of spackle and shine. Her husband will disappear soon in Hong Kong, in the rattle of trams and trash heaps. In the moonlight, her cheeks are blistered plums, plums my mother places on our kitchen windowsill to dry out. Some kind of medicine that would cure the distance between all of us. This stone fruit, blessed in sun and open air. Um, so yeah, my dad was a chain smoker, um, so. <laughs> Um, when he did disappear and leave, um, my mom went on this like massive, like journey of getting rid of everything that smelled or like reeked of cigarettes and distinctly remembered smelling the whole house smelling like orange cleaner in particular. Um, but yeah, all of that. Um, yeah, I don't know if there's other questions. So I will throw it back to you, Susan, or maybe um, Ali, if you have thoughts or words for us. <laughs> I can also so ask I you a question a too. <laughs> yeah, I have a couple of questions. Susan, of course, if you have more reading <laughs> to do, by all means, I would love to hear it. Um, but I would I would like to ask, and audience members, don't be shy. Now is the time. Um, if you have questions, go ahead and throw them in the Q&A. Um, but what for both of you what will you remember most from your time working on these these collections mm. that's a that's kind of a tough one okay <laughs> sorry I mean, okay, I can start because I'm like, okay, I guess I, I thought of something. Um, I don't know. So, I mean, I mentioned earlier, I feel like I spent a long time, like most of my life, kind of actively pushing away, not thinking about or considering like the Vietnamese part of my identity or like really thinking about, okay, how did I end up here? How did my family end up here, right? After the Vietnam War and like all the things associated with that. Um, 
and like yeah I remember growing up people I don't know I, I didn't really want to be seen as Asian to be honest um but at some point in college like maybe it was because I started taking my writing a little bit more seriously or I was just in that certain place in my life where that felt really uncomfortable that I was not I didn't know that much about that part of my identity like a huge part right there's a huge hole there um but I didn't really dig that much further into it until I was doing my MFA and I had space to write and as part of that writing I did a lot of research um like archival research and interviewing family members and you know I took some um like Vietnamese language courses like out of the MFA and some Asian American Pacific Islander like uh, literature courses. I took a lot of classes out of the MFA that also were really wonderful for for me. Um, and like seeing other um, Asian American and Pacific Islander voices. Um, so like, I feel like this book was part of that journey and it's still really a start in terms of learning about myself and my family. Um, but the book definitely helped me process and better understand and I think start asking questions that I wasn't actively thinking about or even knowing how or what to ask um at least I think the book helped me arrive at that even if the book is just like the start of you know grappling or trying to find like an answer if there even is one um some of those questions I love that Susan and also the vulnerability of like what it means to share that journey through a book like you know it's kind of like documented of sorts um, it's funny that you say that because like, you know, um, you know, when I did my MFA uh, many moons ago, I actually am realizing, you know, I think it was like 2008 or something, but like during my time when I went to Iowa, um, I didn't write with a single I voice. And, you know, when you're talking about writing the third, you know, third person of sorts and also um, what it means to, to write in the I voice, for me, it was always like the fear of being, um, like, I felt like I, I didn't matter I didn't I wasn't seen and and that too right that that says something about um how we are quite invisible and it, it, it took me a long time to write in the I voice and to to own that and to say like you know actually there is a lot to explore in terms of my <laughs> my journey and understanding my my multiple identities um and I didn't really write during my time in Iowa about right being Chinese American about I didn't want any ethnic uh, markers to my work. I, I kind of wanted it to be more abstract. And so it's funny that like, you know, after I left that program, I wrote completely differently. You know, like my first book, it just, I broke everything apart. And I was like, I can't write like this anymore. Um, I need to be myself. And it, that means being vulnerable about um, the complicated questions about internalized racism, the ter uh, questions about like, what does it mean to dig closer into histories that scare me, right? And thinking about my histories of, of hunger and starvation during the Great Leap Forward. Um, but yeah, I feel that, I feel that deeply. And I, I, I so badly as, as someone who, you know, teaches in the MFA program, really just want to undo everything that has been done to me, um, especially for my students of color. Um, but, you know, to kind of think about the, you know, Ali's question about like this, this book, you know, and I feel I was telling Susan, it's such, such a magical space to share with a poet who's celebrating their first book um, as I'm celebrating my second, because it is every single time you do it, it's like, holy crap, like, I just poured my entire self into this thing over so many years. Um, and here it is surprise. Um, it's weird because it, you, how much work goes into it. But I think for this book, for me, this book is much more vulnerable than the first in many ways. I feel like I, this book scares me. And I think that that, you know, for instance, just the very topic of the Great Leap Forward, like it's censored in China. And I, I don't know if I can go back quote unquote home, right? Or to at least my my parents' home country. Um, and that, that, that makes me nervous, absolutely. Um, but what I will say about reading from this book and my, so thus far since it's come out is that I've been really, um, it's meant a lot for, especially like students and, and young folks really, you know, digging into their own histories, figuring out their, the things that, you know, that they are struggling with understanding in terms of uh, previous generations. Um, and also the, the fact that a lot of these poems I'm discovering are, are love poems. I, I think that despite the fact that some of the poems are difficult in the book um, in terms of the material or content, um, 
you know, thinking about hunger, there's so much love in the book. And so I didn't realize that until readers were really telling me there's so much nourishment, there's so much joy, despite all the, the pain. And I'm like, oh, that's been really sweet. Um, so that's been really lovely. And also seeing that like both books connect, it's just so funny that like the cover of this book is like kind of similar to Overpour, which also has like a creature, like an animal <laughs> with a like a person like inside of the animal. And now this is like the person's outside of the animal. It's just been so, anyway, I, anyway, I just keep thinking, you know, all these magical connections. Uh, but thank you so much for that question, um, Ali. That was uh, a really thoughtful one thinking about, you know, what it's like to, to, to kind of read the book because we've been working on it these books for so long, sometimes we don't actually sit and read them ourselves as if mm -hmm. we were reading someone else's book. I did that recently and I was like, whoa, I wrote that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for, for sharing um, all of that. I think, yeah, I love it when readers can point out or like show you something about your own work, you know, that you it's right in front of you, but you can't, can't see. Um, yeah, I haven't read my book in a while. I, I don't know, I, I feel the same way. I, I mean, I read it again, I feel like, you know, a handful of months ago when I had to help copy edit it, but that was the first time in a long time, really. Um, and I felt the same way. I was like, oh, you did that. You can write because I haven't been writing very much lately because the world. <laughs> um, and I was like, okay, like, cool, you did that. Um, I guess I, I'm curious, Jane, if you want to answer this, because um, you mentioned, you know, um, this book potentially being or being more vulnerable um, and therefore scary in a lot of ways and it taking in books and poetry like it takes it takes time um someone asked this recently at an event and i really love this question so you don't have to answer it though but I, the, I, the question was how old is the oldest poem in this collection if you want to answer it and like um like what was the last poem that you wrote in the collection and like how did that one come to be was it like the last one you wrote is the last one in the in the collection like how, how it appears or um yeah like you could talk more about that experience I love that question, Susan, and I'll just kind of, um, after I answer it, I'll return it back to, to you. Um, but yeah, that's interesting. And thinking about the last poem of the book is after preparing the altar, the ghosts feast feverishly, which is a mouthful to say, I know. Um, but uh, that poem is so funny because, um, and that one was turned into a, a installation show at the Fire Art Museum. Um, but I actually have been waiting for this poem to arise. Like, I've been writing to my ancestors who did not survive the Great Leap Forward. Like, uh, there's a long poem called, in this book called When You Die. And I basically just write epistolaries or letter poems to them. And they don't answer me. And so I've been waiting for two years uh, for them to, to answer me. And this poem kind of happens. Like, it was, it took two years for me to write it down. But uh, I joke around, but it's true. It's a little woo-woo, but they just wrote this poem. I didn't really write it. It's kind of weird uh, now I think about it, but I was just at a coffee shop grading and it, this poem just came out of me out of nowhere. Um, and so I've never ever had that experience in my entire life. So that's probably the weirdest thing that's the last poem. Um, the Long Labors was just right before it is, is a very new last minute edition. I will say that when I was at the very end of my edits with Alice James, I was like, what if I threw in this poem? And they were like, whoa, okay, uh, it's intense. But um, I was thinking about just labor and just like thinking about like this book is really also thinking about work um, and labor and matrilineal labor in particular, like women, um, my grandmother, my mother, my great grandmother. And so um, that is the most recent one. Um, I don't know about the oldest one. It's probably Notes from the Interior. Um, which probably was supposed to be in the first book, which I think it's just funny that now I'm thinking about it, like the first and second book feel very entangled and I don't mean it to be. Uh, but anyhow, yes, like the last poem totally came to me in basically a type, kind of like fever dream. So uh, <laughs> I will never forget that. I just, I didn't write it. 100% my ancestors wrote it and it's, they just basically said, I want to party. I want to feast. I want to eat everything, including your flip-flops. Uh, so I just thought it was hilarious that they answered my questions with just like, shut up and like, let's party. 
which <laughs> thought was felt so funny. Anyway, Susan, um, I know we just have a few minutes, but I'd love to turn that beautiful question. Yeah, thank you, thank you for sharing that. It's always so interesting because, yeah, I feel like a baby, a baby poet. I mean, this is my first book, and I don't know. It's always interesting to hear other, other people's process. Um, I'll answer really, really fast because I do see um, Sarah has posted something in the Q and A. Um, thank you, Sarah. So I will go real, real fast. Um, probably the oldest poems are probably from maybe 2016, 2017, because I started this um, collection during grad school, and I feel like I didn't consciously think of, like, this project as a project until my third year, um, which was, like, maybe 20, 2017, but I know some of my poems from my first and second year, so, so yeah, maybe 2016, maybe 2015, um, from when I started, probably made their way in, um, just in, like, revised forms. Uh, and the, the last poem I wrote is actually the last one in my book. I don't know how often that happens. I know the poem you mentioned, I was just looking through your collection, it also comes pretty close to the end, I think. Um, and yeah, I, it's also called Unending. I don't know how that happened. Um, but I didn't write it like for this project in mind. Like in my mind, I was like, I'm done with this collection. It's done. Like it's ready to be submitted. It wasn't ready. Um, so I wrote this poem for something totally different for a different um, uh, like kind of multimedia project and so and then when the person was like I want to publish some of these multimedia things can you do a write-up about the photographs you took or write a poem or do whatever you want and I was like this is a challenge to write a poem because I need deadlines and challenges or else I won't right <laughs> um and then I decided what if I threw it into the collection and like what would happen and it fit because even though I thought I was done with the collection I definitely was still writing poems but like we're still in the realm of, of this, the world of Susie with an eye and, and that, that collection for sure. Um, all right, we, we're running out of time. So I wanna throw Sarah's question um, in as well. So has the pandemic and everything that's happened since 2020 changed what you write about or how you write at all? Wow, you know, you were just saying you, Susan, about just kind of like having difficulty writing poems, you know, or just not being like writing poems very much. Um, and just hearing your your answer to kind of the question too of like sometimes being forced to write a poem just kind of like funny um even though it might not you might not know it, it will be in the collection but i was thinking actually this question via sarah um which hi sarah um <laughs> i oh and and also carol uh is here who's like uh, who I had in like a, um, or we were together in a clay class, like ceramics class. I, oh, I'm like having so much trouble writing poems that like now I just do random other things. Like um, Carol and I throw pots. <laughs> Carol is much better than I am <laughs> at throwing, um, you know, and I just need more practice. But I, I think nowadays it's just like, I'm starting to think of writing as just like pretty much anything like I'm just like that soup that was a poem that pot that was a poem I guess it, it's definitely not centered um so I just like I feel like lately I've just been really open to um other ways of creating even if I'm stuck writing and sometimes if I'm stuck writing I will just literally write I'm stuck writing um but anyway um yeah I, I deeply appreciate it yeah and Sarah's a really amazing ceramicist so anyway <laughs> just all to say the answer is like the pandemic has made me uh, better at failing at things I don't know how to do other than like including poetry it's just like I just like to fail at things gardening everything it's just been a different way of thinking um so yeah I'm curious I'm curious how that is for you Susan yeah honestly same I mean I, I didn't get into ceramics I, although I wish I did that's always something that has seemed so cool to me um so I love that you're doing that. I love your answer too, like getting better at failing this year. Someone, I feel like I heard someone say that recently in a, a virtual reading or talk too. And it just made me think of all the things that like I want to do, you know, and like have kind of started or have started. And then I'm like, oh yeah, I should probably pick that up, right? It's okay to not be good. Like it makes sense that you're not good because you have barely tried, right? Or barely started. Um, yeah, I haven't done much writing. I and being gracious with myself because of pandemic and also just having a first book out and it has taken a lot of work I didn't really know or expect in terms of like things leading up to and around around it since it's only been um like two two and a half months it's just more bandwidth and energy than I thought it would take I guess um so I'm being kind in that way and I still like to get crafty and be creative it's just a lot of times just things I can maybe make with my hands or just something different that isn't always necessarily poetry um and yeah 
I'm very guilty of being like, oh yes, I'll do that because now I have a deadline. We'll see what happens. Sometimes it's good. And then sometimes the poem is like totally not ready, but I'm like, okay, this is what I have to read or this is what I have for this, but it's definitely gonna change and, um, and that's okay too. So <laughs> um, yeah, and also someone gave you a shout out for your earrings, which oh. yes, I, like I mentioned earlier, they are wonderful. Your whole <laughs> ensemble looks great. <laughs> Things they're cherry. <laughs> Speaking of Hong Kong, I got these from Hong Kong. A lot. They're very old. They're felt, which is really cool. I've oh, had so cool. to remove them because they totally have fallen off. And what's like one? There's just like one cherry. Oh, interesting. Not the same. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but thank you for that that answer, Susan. And you know, we do all have to be gentle and tender with ourselves during this time, and I guess create in the ways that we we. Um, you know, can find some sort of pleasure in, um, especially, yeah, you're talking with, like, with your hands. Um, but yeah, this was so fun. Thank you so much, Susan. Thank you, everyone, for being here. And, um, you know, it is a Friday, Friday night. And just, yeah, thank you, Allie, too. I don't know if you're, yeah, there you are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm back. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you, Third Place Books, and Allie, of course, and, and Spencer here, if you're soft yeah. there. And everyone attending um yeah and thank you jane this was really wonderful to get to celebrate together um and especially your book which is so so beautiful um and i love the idea you had of us kind of going back and forth and having a, a conversation that way um which i don't feel like is the usual setup so i really i really enjoyed this yeah thanks so much susan please everyone go find zero diaspora i mean to support also just like the, that first book is just yeah it's a beautiful book. I mean, you take a lot of risks in it um, and it's so vulnerable too. So cheers to you. Yay, third place <laughs> books, find us there. <laughs> you guys are making my sign off so easy. <laughs> <laughs> Everything that they just said <laughs> is exactly what I was going to say. Huge, huge thank you to both of you so much for being here. This was so wonderful. Thank you for sharing these poems and stories with us. It has been an absolute pleasure. Audience members, thank you for turning up. We so appreciate you. Um, if you have not yet gotten your hands on copies of these books and you would like to, go ahead and follow these links. I just put them in chat um, so you can easily find them. Uh, go see what they're, you know, go, go check them out. Mm -hmm. um, of course, come in if you're local. We'd love to see you. Or if you're not local, just, you know, tweet us. <laughs> We'd love to hear from you. Let us know what you think. Um, and with that, oh, I wanted to say Jane is coming back uh, on the 18th uh, for a conversation with Kyle Lucia Wu. Oh, uh, she's so good. Uh, yeah, to discuss her new book, Win Me Something. So definitely put that on your cal calendars if that's something you're interested in. Um, and I am so looking forward to it. So we will see you soon. One more huge, huge thank you. And I think that this is when we let the awkward waving commence. So, <laughs> shall we say good night? Bye, everyone. <laughs> Have a good night. Awkward. It is, right? <laughs> All right. Good night, everybody. Bye. Good night. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. <laughs>